uh, always keen to chat with you guys. Yeah, yeah, man. Uh, do you want to maybe just for the audience, just give a little bit about your background and, and uh, what you do over at REN? Yeah, sure. So uh, I'm the chief technology officer at uh, the REN project. Uh, so I sort of lead the technical team uh, and all of the development that happens. Uh, my background is actually in distributed systems and supercomputing. So I uh, did my thesis on that in university. Uh, and I got into the crypto space around 2017. Um, I had I kind of seen Bitcoin around 2012, I think. And it was interesting to me, but I, I didn't kind of vibe with the whole cypherpunk attitude uh, that the community had back then. Um, and so once it became a little bit more mainstream and was, I think, a little bit more developer focused by the time 2017 rolled around, it caught my interest a lot more. And I got into the space. I mean, blockchains are basically just big distributed systems and very slow supercomputers. <laughs> so uh, my expertise was pretty well placed. Um, me and my co-founder, Ty, we pretty quickly uh, sort of discovered that niche of uh, interoperability and, and, and the need for that. And so we, we've been dig we dug into it and we've been working on it for I think, three years now. Cool. Yeah. I, you guys were like the first with this interoperability and, you know, especially now like bringing like Bitcoin onto Ethereum and, and it's really exciting. Um, specifically when you guys were kind of starting this project, what, what was like the original problem that you guys were trying to solve? So way back in 2017, when we first got together, we were actually trying to develop a decentralized dark pool, which is a kind of exchange where the book is hidden. So you don't know, uh, what people are trying to sell, how much of it they're trying to sell. Um, and, and the reason you want this is because it allows you to move large volumes without moving the market, right? without revealing your intent. Um, and we, we developed this, we took it to mainnet, we got there, we were using atomic swaps at the time because uh, all of the volume is in, at that time was in Bitcoin and uh, Tether. And of course those aren't on Ethereum. Uh, there's no smart contracting capabilities for those platforms. And so, uh, you know, you were very restricted in what you could do. Um, and ultimately just too restricted. Uh, the kinds of free option problems uh, that you encounter when you use atomic swaps are just insurmountable for the kind of volumes you're working with in a dark pool. We are talking about, you know, single trades that are in the you know, double digits of millions of dollars. Uh, and so we realized that if there's going to be progress made here, we had to solve the interoperability problem properly. Um, and it was somewhat serendipitous that the technology we were using for decentralized dark pools turned out to be the right technology to use for interoperability as well. Uh, and once we sort of explored that space, came up with a preliminary solution and realized there was really an opportunity to actually solve this properly, it became immediately apparent that this was so much bigger than dark pools. You know, I mean, interoperability is useful for pretty much any application that you might think of. Um, and so we sort of expanded the, the scope of our, our protocol proper and um, yeah, decided to to pursue that uh, as a sole focus very cool and, and so maybe for for some of the less technical audience do you want to maybe just give like a brief what what is a dark pool and, and just what, what what that is uh in, in maybe layman terms for some people yeah it's just um it's just an exchange where you can't see the order book so typically if you go on to uniswap you can see what the current price is right now because you know it's it's an automated market maker or if you go into binance you can see you know, the buys and the sells, the volumes and the different prices that those are happening at. In a dark pool, you just can't see that. You kind of say, this is my order. I wanted to execute a market price um, or I wanted to execute the specific price. This is how much I'm selling. And you kind of just send it off uh, and the system comes back and says, yep, we found you a match or it didn't. And so you kind of, uh, you don't get any visibility into what the intent of other people in the system is unless you match with them. Got it. Okay, that, that makes a lot more sense. And so, so with Ren, uh, what other things are, are you guys looking to kind of bring into the, these dark, dark pools? And is there anything else you got kind of we're talking about Tether and Bitcoin? Is there anything else that you guys are, are looking for? Well, so since we hit the interoperability play, we kind of have put dark pools on the back burner and we, we aren't exploring them actively at the moment. And what we're focusing on now is just bringing as many different assets into the interoperability world as possible connecting as many different chains as possible uh, and really focusing on the ability for interoperability uh, in what we call like a universal sense. Uh, so universal in the sense that it's any token, any chain, um, any one, so, you know, it's permissionless and all this good stuff, uh, but also any application. So, you know, we don't want to focus on one specific thing. Um, and again, to go back to atomic swaps as an example, they're really great when you want to swap small amounts of tokens, but maybe you want to, lend or maybe you want to you know collateralize a synthetic um 
or maybe you want to engage with an automated market maker, you can't do those with atomic swaps because they're, they're specifically a swap solution. And I guess it's in the name, right, in that sense. So uh, if you want to do something more generic or if some crazy new fancy interesting application is thought of in the future, um, you know, you want to, you want to be using an interoperability solution that is completely generic and completely universal that you know is going to work in the future. And so that's really our focus at the moment. Cool. Yeah. And so you've seen, seen a lot of this and talking to the future a little bit, what, what are you most excited about with, with the DeFi right now yourself personally? I'm, I am excited to see some cross-chain DeFi actually happening. I think, you know, a lot of activity happens on Ethereum because that's where a lot of activity happens. It's kind of the self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, if you're, if you want to build a DeFi application today, it makes sense to pick Ethereum, even if all of the other problems uh, you know, kind of getting in your way, or even if it's not the best technical solution for you, because that's that's where all the other applications are that you can compose with. Um, and at, at the end of the day, I think the composability of um, DeFi is one of its major strong suits. So what I'm really excited for in the future is to see uh, once we connect different smart contract chains. Uh, so the REN project today already supports Binance uh, Smart Chain. It supports Ethereum. Uh, very soon, it'll be supporting Polkadot, uh, substrate uh, parachains and all the, uh, those kinds of categories. Um, we already support a Cosmos chain um, and Zoom will also support uh, Avalanche. So you have all these different smart contract platforms and once they can connect to each other, now you can build your DeFi application wherever you want. Um, or you could even build a DeFi application that's not in any one place, but it's actually in all places simultaneously. You know, you could think of a liquidity pool that is actually a liquidity pool that exists on multiple chains simultaneously. So you can have like ETH and if you, you know, you can draw that ETH out on Ethereum if that's where you need it, or you can draw that same ETH out on Avalanche if that's where you need it or on Binance Smart Chain if that's where you need it. So these sort of like developers will stop having to think about chains as like these individual things that don't talk to each other. They just, it's almost an, becomes this abstraction that you don't even think about anymore. You just build your application, you build it anywhere you want, and you can access any other application, any other token, and it's you know, it's not a concern. Yeah, it's gonna be fascinating. I was just playing around with with some Binance Smart Chain stuff today, and it's crazy being able to you know hop between each of these just within MetaMask. And so, kind of along those lines too, you know, 2020 was kind of the year we had a lot of yield farming, and it was a lot of like growing these liquidity pools what do you think is going to be the theme for going forward 2021 um oh, good question i think um i don't think your farming is going to go anywhere i think we've seen that that's a pretty interesting way to draw some initial traction to your project um you know it's, it's a a good way to um almost do the same types of things as an ico in the sense of you get people into your community you get your governance token or your utility token out into people's hands, which is where you need it to be. Uh, but at the same time, you're giving people some initial yield, which is kind of this like preliminary incentive to get involved in your project. I think through 2021, we'll see those systems mature a little bit more. We'll see the same kind of thing that we saw with the ICO craze, which is where the really crap ones will stop being so successful and stop being so crazy and overhyped. But you'll see a, a focusing on how to do it right in some sense. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I think we'll still see... I you know, DeFi will continue to expand basically through 2021 and you'll find me anywhere, but it'll become a bit more, uh, yeah, a bit less crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And everyone listening, uh, definitely go follow Loong on, on Twitter. What, what's your Twitter handle? Uh, BZLWANG. Cool. Yeah. We'll make, we'll make sure to drop that in, in the description after. Um, but definitely, definitely. I know that you're always tweeting some, some, I love following your account and you always got some, some very, good things to, to say about, about what's going on in, in the DeFi world. Uh, with, with your Re, Ren VM's work with, with Chainlink, kind of, do you want to talk about how proof of reserve works um, within your system? Sure. So with any kind of interoperability system, there's always a risk that something's going to go wrong. Um, I mean, this is the case with any system, really. Uh, and what's cool about the proof of reserve is that it, it's kind of this oracle to contracts of if something has gone wrong. So it enables them to sort of implement fail safes. Um, you know, you could imagine an insurance contract, for example, that pays out if, you know, uh, suddenly the RenVM system fails and the collateral that represents, um, you know, the Bitcoin that's moving around between chains suddenly becomes worth nothing. Uh, you can have an insurance contract pay out or you can have some kind of emergency lever pulled, which stops people, you know, depositing collateral or withdrawing that collateral, um, you know, 
these kinds of like emergency backstops that you want to put in place in case something goes wrong, now you can do that um, by using the proof of reserve contract. Got it. Okay. Yeah. And, and so as a developer yourself, the, over, over the past couple months and, and even a little bit before that, we see a lot of these kind of flash loan attacks and different things that are happening within decentralized oracles. What are your views specifically on, on decentralized oracles and these attacks in general that, that are happening? Uh, I think um, I don't really, I mean, a lot of these, I wouldn't even class necessarily as attacks. Mm -hmm. I actually think that um, deficient systems, you know, these systems that are, uh, have a proper set of rules built in um, that, I mean, mo most of these attacks, or at least some of the big ones that I've seen recently have come down to using the wrong price Oracle, right. And saying you're using the spot price on something like Uniswap, which is trivial to change with a, um, a flash loan. And so it's not so much that these attacks are actually attacks, they're just um, they're market manipulation, sort of instantaneous uh, and almost instantly resolved market manipulation. Um, the more people you have telling you what the price of something is, uh, and the more um, diversity you have in the ways that people are deciding what the price is, whether it's spot, whether it's some kind of windowed average, the harder these markets become to manipulate, because you would now have to find a way to manipulate multiple sources. Um, when it comes to on-chain oracles, they obviously have the advantage of being on-chain, um, but they suffer from this ability to be manipulated by flash loans and, and similar attacks. Um, with decentralized oracles that are actually coming from off-chain, which is what Chainlink is, again, you, you take on the risk that that system is going to go wrong because it's an off-chain system, but you get the advantage that it's harder to manipulate. It can't be manipulated by a flash loan, for example. Um, so, you know, you're making trade-offs in safety. Uh, I think the, the right thing to do is get as many of these different oracles working as possible, see which ones stand the test of time, um, mm -hmm. and use as many of them as possible. Yeah, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And, and so yourself, uh, you know, as a CTO at, at REN Project and, and kind of been around in this space for, for a while, how did you first get into, you know, engineering within DeFi or, you know, and just cryptocurrency in, in general? Um, so I'd been working with Ty, the CEO of, of Ram Project, um, in a bunch of projects prior to crypto. Um, and he got into um, the space uh, as a trader. So um, he co-founded Virgil Capital, which was, um, I think, early 2017, late 2016, sort of AI-driven uh, trading firm uh, that worked exclusively with crypto. And, I mean, he fell in love with the space and he and I were working very closely um, for at that time and in the years prior. So he kind of reached out to me and said, well, you know, you've got expertise in the space. You should come take a look at it and get interested in it um, because there's, there's no way that we won't be able to find some way to contribute value. Um, you know, he's a, he's a very clever guy. Uh, I'm a reasonably clever guy. And so, uh, and the space was so young and so nascent, it was just uh, sort of ripe for finding an opportunity. Um, I think we started using the term DeFi a lot earlier than I think it had been popularized. I think there was a period where people were kind of confused about whether it should be called DeFi or the, for a period it was almost called open finance as well. Um, I think that happened in kind of late 2018. Um, I think I didn't actually get interested in DeFi directly. I got interested in our project specifically and then people started referring to it as DeFi and we started talking about it. And so you're kind of like, oh, okay, I guess we're, I guess we're categorized as this. Um, and so then that's when I started looking further into it. And I think once we got closer to mainnet, it became more and more relevant to look at um, what were the projects that are out there right now that could benefit from this technology and that you get, you, you sort of get forced to start exploring these other projects. Um, one of the first ones we explored was Curve Finance. Um, uh, it's one of our biggest contributors of volume uh, for cross-chain sort of assets. Uh, yeah. And I just thought that was, you know, I looked into how that worked and, 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 you know, where they'd gone and the guys that built it are incredibly smart and have a lot of interesting ideas around different incentive models. And um, yeah, I mean, once you start getting into it, it's just, it's a bug, right? Like <laughs> there's so much to explore and experiment with. Cool. For you, for you, all, all the entrepreneurs that, that are listening out there and people that, that are thinking like, all right, uh, 20, 2021 is going to be my year. I'm going to, I'm going to build something. What do you have any advice for, for these developers? Yeah. Um, make sure you find, a way to add value, not just extract value. Uh, as an entrepreneur, it's, it's, it's tempting to try and say, you know, how can I raise money? How can I get value flowing to my company so I can have a team? Um, but before you can even think about that question, you have to think about how do I actually add value to a space? Um, 
sometimes that can be something really simple, like taking something that's already been done and then just doing it slightly better. Um, yeah. Or, but, but most of the time it's by doing something unique, right? And so I think this space is so wild and so weird. Um, there's this ability, unlike any other entrepreneurial space, to just experiment like crazy. Um, just try different models that may not even seem like they make any sense. Like when you first hear about a flash loan or when I try to explain it to any of my friends in traditional finance, they're just like, oh, this doesn't make any sense. <laughs> um, so start with that willingness to just like explore anything, but with a key focus on actually trying to add value to the ecosystem, add something that doesn't exist, but also something that people are actually going to find useful. Yeah, I think that that's fantastic advice. And, and so that you're, you're building something that's extremely, extremely valuable. But what, what else is like something that you're missing? Like, is there any tools that add value that, that you wish someone was there, out there kind of building at the moment? Oh, um, I'm super into the mempool. Um, and it's kind of getting a bit more attention these days. Um, I think there's a, a few companies that have been like, exploring that space for a little while and they're just kind of coming to the stage where they're being able to provide sort of production ready systems, but ways to analyze what's happening in the mempool. So this is, you know, the set of transactions that haven't quite made it into a block yet, but they're kind of waiting around and wanting to make it into a block. There's this huge unexplored set of opportunities around being able to predict how the state of Ethereum is going to change given these transactions that are going to be coming in soon and trying to change the state you know, trying to predict what order they're going to come in, trying to obfuscate what they're doing while they're sitting in the mempool. So you're not like revealing your intent too much. Um, and you can get front run, you can get back run, you can get sandwiched by traders. Um, this whole like dark forest narrative that's being created around the mempool, I think is super interesting. Uh, I think there's, there's a lot of value to be extracted in that space um, and a lot of value to be added for users. Because I think if you can extract value from the mempool, there's an easy way to sort of give that back to the users. Um, yeah, so I think that's super valuable. I think there's a few people looking into that, but um, yeah, I think it'll get more attention over the coming years. Yeah, exciting. Uh, and then so what's next on your, your product roadmap? I know we kind of talked about it on, on the beginning, but with REN project specifically, um, where, where are you guys kind of focused on towards the end of this year and then uh, to start off 2021? Yeah, so I mean, honestly, the end of this year is kind of boring for us technically. We're doing a lot of cleanup, um, a lot of documentation, getting prepared, for 2021, you know, um, sharpening the ax, so to speak. Um, 2021 is going to be a really big year for Ren Project. We're going to be supporting a bunch of new chains, um, you know, Polkadot, Avalanche, uh, a bunch of new assets. We're going to add some new features that um, we don't currently have. So the ability to move Bitcoin uh, through chains where Bitcoin's not even involved. So for example, right now you can take Bitcoin and you can put it on Ethereum, or you can take Bitcoin and you can put it on Binance Smart Chain, but you can't take Bitcoin that's on Binance Smart Chain and move it to Ethereum you have to go, kind of go back through Bitcoin first. So we're excited to release that feature. Um, we're excited to support ETH and ERC20s on other chains and vice versa. So like BNB and, and BEP tokens on, on Ethereum uh, and, and the other chains we support. Um, yeah, and expanding sort of the decentralization of our network. Uh, we already have 1500 nodes active, um, but 2021 is going to be a big year for experimenting with different economics, different incentives to sort of bump that number up even higher and, and get even more decentralized. Very cool. Yeah, very exciting times for, for what you guys are working on. Some very interesting stuff. So I'm really excited to see see where, where it comes along. Uh, if people want to follow your guys' progress and, and join your communities, where's the where's the best place for them to talk with the team and talk with the community? Um, the best place is probably our Telegram. Come in. It's Ren, It's just Ren Project. Um, you can follow us on Twitter, Ren Protocol, um, or you can follow myself on Twitter and you'll sort of see who, um, the things that I retweet. Most most of it's um, most of the stuff that happens in our project, I'll retweet at some point. Uh, so yeah, I think Twitter and Telegram are, are the two main ones. Cool, yeah, I'll make sure to drop those links in, in the description afterwards. And yeah, is there anything else that maybe we didn't talk about that, that you wanna last say to, to the audience? No, I think that's, I think that's everything. Yeah, this is, this is an interesting conversation. So I, I really appreciate you coming on, Loon. Um, this is a lot of fun. Everyone, I really want to thank the audience for, for joining us this evening uh, or day or wherever you may be. Uh, definitely uh, join our Southeast Asia uh, Facebook and Telegram groups. I think uh, someone in the audience might be able to drop them. If not, they'll definitely be in the description afterwards. Uh, otherwise, Loon, thanks again for, for joining. Thanks so much for having me, guys.